Hi everyone, welcome to my allotment. I thought I'd do a video about how to start no dig, either for your garden or for your allotment. It's the way I chose to do it when I got the plot because I knew I would not be able to do all the digging. I have a full-time job and it was a huge plot so, and I wanted to get growing. And so I thought I'd do this video and hopefully help someone out who's considering it. You can also change over from dig at any time and I thought I'd just go through what I've learnt in my experience and how you get the knowledge. Alright? So if you're like me and you're female possibly of a smaller frame, maybe you already have an injury whatever, that stops you from digging your plot or maintaining your plot the way you would like to, then this method is, is a good one for you. So, so what is no-dig? Well, basically, it's a method of weed suppression, maintaining soil quality, and feeding the soil. So all those three in one. There's lots of other little positives as well, but those are the basics. So you put a mulch on top, of your soil and that stops the weeds growing through it from below. It uh, stops seeds in the top layer of the soil germinating, that which could happen or happens a lot more when you dig over because they're exposed to the sunlight and whatever. All these seeds have been lying dormant all of a sudden come to life. And it also feeds the soil so you don't need to use any fertilizer. The, the mulch that you use, if you use organic matter, um, will add the nutrients, all the nutrients that you need. So the way you do it when it's up and running is that you feed the soil once a year with a mulch and you spread it quite thinly then and it goes on top of your already made beds and that's really the main maintenance and it's in the winter months when you have the time to do it. Other than that throughout the year there's the weeding. So how do you get started? Well, so I say the first thing you should do, and there's a lot of do's and a few don'ts, is do your research. So where I started was through Charles Dowding and Stephanie Hafferty. They have both excellent websites. Uh, Charles is the one with the wealth of knowledge about uh, the different methods and uh, his YouTube videos his books and his Instagram. So I first heard him mentioned by uh, uh, Monty Don and after that that was just when I was looking to get the plot so I was like wow that sounds just what I need so I looked into it read up on all, all of it and then like a few weeks later I started. So the first thing is to do your research. Uh, the second thing would be to be patient. Yes you can grow in the first season but your plot won't look fantastic it won't look like a my plot or other plots you see on instagram the first growing season it will look a lot better the second year and then from then on you're flying when you mulch you mulch deep and they often say this on gardener's world as well when they talk about mulching your garden around your, your flowers it's better to mulch properly in one area than spread it thinly if you're low on compost for example so it's better to do one bit properly than not at all right and once you've spread the compost, I'd say it's definitely, you know, you work, walk to firm it in. Don't leave it loose because then the risk is that it'll run away with the, with the rain or the wind or whatever it's, if it's very dry. So the best thing to do is obviously to do it in winter, but if you're starting any time during the year, it's fine. And there's a few don'ts. Um, don't weed the area before you start. No, it's no need. Um, if there are huge like cooch grass mounds or lots and lots of bindweed, you know, you can go over the, the perennials, the really tough perennials like mare's tail or whatever, uh, you're not likely to, to kill them with the mulch in the first year unless you do it the proper way, which is to have them covered, have it light excluded over them for over a year. Um, which I didn't, I didn't have that patience. So specifically bindweed, which is my issue here, you know, it takes a long time to kill those roots and I'm not even sure you can uh, really suppress them because 
I feel like they are connected, had a huge network under the ground, and if you don't, if you don't kill the the, the main route, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna get it. You can keep it under control, but you can't ever outright kill it. And the obvious one is don't dig unless you have to. I I do dig down with a pointy weeding tool, or maybe a trowel if I'm getting bindweed out. Or I did dig when I was digging out my massive cardoon plant, but otherwise, you know, I don't dig. I don't fork, and I I use a hoe very rarely and only lightly on the surface. And uh, one of the most important don'ts is don't listen to non-believers. Trust the method, it works. You have to know enough about it to know how to do it right, but trust the method, it does work. So what are the positives? What are the pros with no dig? Well, there are many. Um, the, one of the first one, which has been very relevant now, is moisture retention. So the, the dug soil, just, you know, what that looks like when it's really, really dry and hot and like it was in May this year in the UK. It just sets solid, like almost like cement and you can't get your, even your spade in it and it becomes impossible to work with. So that does not happen because you have compost mulch and it's a completely different texture of it and it does not behave like a dug over plot. I'm on heavy clay, so that's, <laughs> that's what my plot does, right? And on the other hand, this winter we had a lot of rain and my plot did not flood at, at all. So the drainage is maintained, which in a dug area, it, you, you destroy the whole, like the micro uh, environment, the micro um, tunnels and everything like, like um, the worms make or the little insects or whatever, you know, all that structure is destroyed and it just becomes a solid mass when you dig. In no dig, that's just not, that's just left. So when the water comes, it just drains into it and it is not a problem planting really early in spring like I managed to do this year because I was on it with the sowing. I spoke to one of the other plot holders, old Tom, which who's post, um, who's picked, uh, whose plot I use for pictures sometimes and, and um, they're always impressive but he told me he uh, got no broad beans this year because the soil was so wet for him to sow. So, you know, I got plenty of broad beans. I sowed them both in winter and I sowed them in spring, no problems. So, uh, and he also could not walk onto his plot because it was so wet. So that's one of the big pros for me. The other thing I touched on pre briefly was that the, the, the microenvironment stays intact. And there's lots of organisms in the soil that is beneficial for growing plants and, and vegetables. There's the um, mycorrhizal fungi, which you can buy in a bag and, and help with the rooting as a powder, right? And that lives in the soil uh, different types of, of fungi as well and it has like a network and every time you dig you destroy that network so a fungi is a funny organism like it, it it is made up it's not just a little mushroom or whatever it's like a, it's a lot of lots of tendrils in the ground in the soil and they all communicate with each other and they um, they work with plants in that they exchange nutrients um, the fungi wants something that the plant produces and vice versa so it's a symbiotic relationship and you want to encourage that as much as possible and that as I said stays intact when you don't dig the soil. So as I mentioned before you use the mulch to to reduce uh, the weed growth and basically no dig ground is has less weeds and that's because um, the weeds are there for a purpose, they are there to fill open ground and when you disturb soil you create open ground and they are designed to take the opportunity so they will just swarm and they will all grow. If you leave it as it is and instead you suppress with mulch on top you get much 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 less germination. You get stuff that flies in like dandelions, you know, you will get them because they will germinate the same year as they are flown in 
but a lot of other stuff is just reduced. I I can't say I do much hoeing. There's not much, there's not many of those little seedlings I get. What I do get is the bindweed and I dig that up. But other than that, it's, it's, it's not much. The other positive thing about it is that it's warmer. So again, because the structure is intact, uh, the warmth from deep in the ground is is carried up in much more easier than if you dig it. So this can be measured with the temperature in the soil, basically. And that is really important for early spring sowing. So the, the earlier in the spring that you can sow or plant, um, the sooner you can fill that hungry gap towards the end of spring when not much is, is cropping. So that's what it's all about, you know, maximizing your plot's potential. The other positive for me is that when you harvest, you finish harvesting one crop and you want to plant the next, it's super quick. You twist out your fennel or whatever, your broad bean in late spring, early summer, and then you do a bit of hoeing, you, you even out the surface, and then you just plant straight into it. No need to do anything else. You mulch in winter, and it's all ready to go. And then the final one, which I also touched on before, is that you don't need to feed your plants. I do feed um, my giant pumpkin, you know, and I do feed things that are in the greenhouse, even though the greenhouse is also no dig, because they are tomatoes and they are hungry. Um, and if I have outdoor tomatoes, I might give them a feed as well, but nothing else I I don't feed You know the the feed the food that the plants need each year is Not from digging in manure but or uh, Chicken pellets or sh sorry What's it called? Yeah, is it called chicken pellets? Well, bloodfish and bone or or whatever, you know, it comes from the organic matter that has decomposed into a compost and that's where the nutrients come from and that lying there in winter is then brought into the underlying soil with the help of the worms the wood lice the whatnot that live in in the soil and it enriches it so with the weeding i'd say i weed maybe i try to weed each bed once a week and it's to be on top of the bindweed. So I do mention bindweed a lot. But basically, the idea with the perennial weeds, uh, like mare's tail, horse tail, uh, and thistles, is that you keep weakening the root, the feeder root down deep in the soil. You can never dig it up, right? You can never get it all out. Um, so by weakening it, and you're, you're restricting its access to light, which is what those things are that come up. They, they're looking for light. And in the end, it weakens the root to the point where you can really easily keep on top of it. So I did not manage to weed a lot last year because I had a baby. Um, so I'm really, really, really committed this year to hopefully it'll be better next year, you know? Fingers crossed. But the the... The point of weeding, you know, it's the same if you dig or no dig, but it's to do it little and often, little and often. So when you're there harvesting, you see a weed, you know, you pull it. You have a harvest basket and a, a weed bucket, you know, and then you've done that bed already. So starting no dig is a bit of a, an investment. You're investing in your plot and what you're investing is time and resources. So the time is your time. You have to spend the time doing it. And also you might have to spend time waiting, waiting for through that first season to get to the point where you're, you're using the whole area the way you want to. And in resources, it's the material that you use to mulch with. So that can be uh, a monetary investment, but I would say it's worth it in the long run. If you're planning on growing several years, it's worth it to do that investment in the beginning and then it's all set up. So if you get it right in the first year, the next years are much easier. They're plentiful harvests 
and it's just amazing. You know, you become the envy of all the other plot holders. I don't know how many comments I've had about my plot and saying that they're so amazed that there's so much growing, you know. And it's using the nodig. I have time to actually grow stuff rather than just digging, right? <laughs> if only someone could do something about that bloody bindweed, hey? So the dog soil has these really, really uniform particles um, and they can slop next to each other like this. Whilst the dog, the nose dogs, no dig stuff has a whole range of particles in it, size, shape, and they form a different structure with air between them. The, one of the big reasons why people dig is that you want to create this light, fluffy soil to grow into. But in fact, because you're breaking up, breaking it up into these fine, fine particles that are all the same shape and they all slot in really close together, they're actually forming a medium that's not right for growing stuff in. What you want is, is the nodic stuff where the, the particles in the soil are all different shapes, all different sizes, and they don't slot next to each other. They actually sit together in a way that has air between them and the air is where the good stuff is right so the the air is what's needed for the roots to grow water of course but the air in association with the water you know so you're trying to do one thing with digging but you're actually making it worse so the one thing that this is not true for is potatoes. So Charles Dowding does a lot of uh, trials where he compares dig versus no dig. He does this every year. I don't know how many years he's done it now. Seven or eight or nine years even. Where he uh, grows the same lot of vegetables next to each other in the same growing space, the same amount of fresh compost every year. But one is dug and the other one isn't. Double dug, I think. Or trench, whatever it's called. I don't know. Um, and the potatoes is the one where you might see maybe it's equal or maybe it's a bit less with the dog, the, the no dig, sorry. So in my experience, yes, that's true. Um, but, you know, <laughs> potatoes are still plentiful. It's, it's like um, you get enough, you get more than you need or more than you can store is usually the case for me anyway. So... I don't really see that as a problem, but you should be aware that if you do no dig and you want lots and lots of potatoes, I would say maybe grow them in bags, right? So there are positives to ground potatoes no dig in that they, you basically you just make a hole and plop it in like maybe 10 centimeters down and then you cover that and that's sort of all you do. You can when they've grown up and you're weeding and you see that some of the potatoes are starting to poke out or very close to the surface of the soil, you can put some compost and earth them up, right? But just to cover them to exclude any light so they don't go green. As opposed to when you dig in, you're continuously earthing up so they have all the, um, you know, the, the potato stem the, uh, then has an opportunity to form lots and lots and lots of uh, uh, potatoes along it, right? So you get more, you get a bigger harvest like that. And they do like to grow uh, the, because of the way they grow they like to spread out and that's why they like looser soil. But I would say if you really want a huge harvest, you should grow them in bags. One of the other positives when you grow potatoes, no dig, is that because they're not trenched up, they're all growing in the surface mulch. They don't go deep, or as in you don't have to dig deep to get them out, as you're more likely to get them all out. You know, there's a lot of people uh, who say they don't grow potatoes anymore because they just end up with potatoes in every bed and they're always coming up and they're quite large plants. Um, so they've resorted to also growing them in bags. So maybe that's the way forward, just to grow them in bags and then they're contained and you know that all the potatoes are in there. Uh, <laughs> so the way I did my beds, I had quite a large area. I started with one, two, three four, five, six beds. This is quite a lot, they're quite long. I think they're like six meters by two meters. So yeah, it's quite a lot. <laughs> but you know, I, I I had the opportunity to buy cow manure from a farmer who delivered on the plot. It still costs a lot. I think it was a, a ton 
for 60 pounds. <clears throat> I think that's what it was, or was it a half ton? I can't remember now, but I think I had three deliveries. Uh, and then I used black polythene, uh, which is does not let any light in because I knew it was like rough, rough, rough pasture here. It was no, uh, there was no beds or anything to start with. Um, I dug out some brambles, which is advisable, uh, and some of the big couch grass, but not much. And it was in winter, so the bindweed was non-existent. I didn't know we had bindweed then, <coughs> but I knew there would be some horrible weeds. So I bought polythene. I think it was on Amazon, and I used a blunt spade to put it in just around the edges, and that completely excluded the light. However, I was, you know, I was, uh, I'd read, I'd read in Charles Dowding's book that you can grow potatoes and squash through polythene. So I planned to do that. I bought lots of heritage potatoes to try and see which ones were good. Um, but the problem is that then you cut a hole. It's still maybe 60 centimeters between each hole, but there's still a hole where the potato is growing and that's enough to keep the bindweed going. You know, it kind of just like goes along the surface and then it pokes up in the hole, you know. It's a, it's a relentless. Uh, so I shouldn't have done that, but I did. And the squash as well. So the, the problem with polythene is they harbor slugs. So, you know, if you're going to use polythene, and I do recommend that you do the first year, you can even share it with another plot holder or... Even on Instagram, might be someone who wants to share the polythene uh, because that is obviously a big negative that you're using plastic. I'm still using mine, so you know I get some use out of it. But it does the job the best, right? So if you leave that on for a year, yeah, well done. I could not, I, I couldn't wait that long. Um, but yeah, that is the best way to do. So then, after the first year, I took off the polythene. And in that winter, I mulched on top again with compost. So I basically buy either bulk bag, whatever's the cheapest, or I buy bags from home base, so, you know, um, or B and Q. You know, cost is an issue. But in subsequent years, the first year you mulch. The best is to mulch a deep, maybe fifteen centimeters. That's quite deep, but it works. And and then the rest. Of the next year you only need to do maybe three to five centimeters the other option which I've done as well on smaller beds later on is to use cardboard as a mulch and it, it's really good I just did not have access to it or it needs to be the thick stuff without lots of ink and plastic and whatever on it so it's a bit tricky to find I'm sure there's loads around um, and then you put compost on top of that again 15 centimeters is the best so the, the cardboard will deteriorate, I think, the earliest I've had bindweed through, when it's gone, um, is maybe like two months later, and they start coming up, you know, and then you know that the, comp the, the cardboard has uh, deteriorated to the point where bindweed can find a way through. So if you have lots of stubborn perennials, use polythene. If you're lucky and you're just doing it on like lawn, in your garden you can just use cardboard and uh, and mulch deep <coughs> the positive is when you mulch deep like that on top of cardboard is just you can just plant into it it's great and if you can put up with bindweed or whatever coming through and just keep on top of it that works too so hopefully you'll all become cardboard hoarders just like me and let all your neighbors know that you <laughs> want their cardboard from all their deliveries and yeah, just start, you know, just start. It might seem like a huge mountain to climb, but it's worth it in the end. If you have any questions, just let me know. I'll try to help as much as possible, but I've showed you the direction where you go to find your information. <laughs> the teenagers are back. Go to Charles Dowding's website. He has online courses. You can go to his garden for courses after the pandemic. Um, and uh, his books and his Instagram are inspirational. So my light is going now and maybe that's good because I can just talk 
forever about no dig. Uh, it's like the best thing I've ever done. So I hope I've answered some of your questions. Let me know if there's some I've missed. And uh, yeah, happy growing and just start, you know, just get on it.